Hello and welcome to another episode of the SciShow Talk Show, the episodes of SciShow where we talk about stuff with super cool people. Now today we're doing something a little bit different. I don't think that Rick Hughes is technically a scientist. Are you? No. No. It's Rick Hughes, however, has trained pretty much 100% of SciShow's staff at the University of Montana. So we are greatly in his debt. He is a professor of media arts at the University of Montana. I think one of the founding members of the media arts program at the university. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and makes it so that, one, uh, there are just high-quality, intelligent, uh, pa passionate people coming out of the university in media arts, and two, to make sure that there is uh, technology being mixed into the curriculum there, because as you know, sometimes universities are a little slow to react to these kinds of changes, and that's very important to me, because what we do here is uh, pretty reliant upon technology. So thank you for coming. You're welcome. This is great. So what is it like to try and get a uh, one a university and also your students to adopt these new technologies as part of what they're doing? Because I mean, we are now in a world where basically there's very little that you are taught at university that you can't find out on your own. Correct. The information that that students are dealing with is accessible. I mean, I have a device in my pocket right now that I can get whatever I need. So it's no longer a question of coming into the room and sitting with your notebook because this person at the front of the room has got all the information and he's a genius and you're a moron. There's not going to be much that I say that you can't Google or find immediately, literally right now with your device that you have on your, mm -hmm. either your laptop, your phone, or whatever it is. And when you say those things that aren't Googleable, you should just tell those people to put it online so that someone else can Google it. Yeah, I might tell an anecdote about my childhood that I might not want to talk about. <laughs> but yeah, basically, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collaborative, communal kind of experience. And it's ironic to me because so many people think of cyberspace and the internet um, and the web as this sort of cold, you know, mm -hmm. digital world. And one of the things I'm trying to... Um, I don't, to be honest with you, like, I don't have to convince the students of this. Yeah. Um, because the, these are folks, by and large, who, particularly the freshmen this year, who are 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, they've grown up with it. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a little more difficult to convince older folks that there is a kind of um, personal connection that you can make. Um, you, over the internet or on the internet or on the web or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I use anecdotes all the time. We do a lot of video conferencing. Each year we do more and more. One of the faculty members came in. At the time I was the director of the school and he said, God, wouldn't it be great if we could get a, you know, like David Lynch to come here because he was born in Missoula. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we don't have a budget to get David Lynch to fly to Missoula. That's not happening. So I said, well, call him and see if he would do a... a yeah, you know, do a Skype or a, or a FaceTime. So we set it up, and David was kind enough to uh, to do it. And we had an iMac that we hooked into our monitor system, and David had his you know his power book, and done deal. And uh, and it's only become easier since then. And it's easier now. Now I mean, everybody now knows it's, exactly you know, how it works. You and bet. And now I think the other thing that's happening now, which is the mobility. So now. We can do it, you can do it anywhere. So wirelessly, you can begin mm -hmm. to do it. One of the things that Media Arts has done, and I think we've done pretty well, is that we have kept our eye on emerging technology. So that's part of my job, is to look down the road. So uh, we're the folks that generally would be knocking on the provost store and saying, you know, mobile technologies around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and they listen. And um, but you know the university system and education in general, as you know, is, is a big thing with a lot. Of, it's like government. There's a lot of people, so it it's not a motorboat. It's more like a battleship. So you you have to really plan what you do because it affects a lot of people. But right. I think the the heart. Uh, I think everybody's heart is in the right place, and people are beginning to discover, as I said earlier, um, this communal nature, the personal nature right. of the internet. So that's good news. You teach. Uh, music, you teach art, you teach video. I started as a musician and I actually was first hired at the university as a, as a teacher in their, as their music technology. But at this stage of my career, you know, closer to the end than the beginning, my job is to design experiences and create environments by which students and faculty, frankly, can maximize their potential. I don't look at myself as, you know, as an editor or, mm -hmm. or anything. Because I believe the 21st century is an integrated century. It's not a century of I do one thing 
incredibly well. Yep. Um, as I say to my students, if you, if you want to be Yo-Yo Ma, God love you. And I think that's awesome. But it's going to require you playing the cello every day for yeah. eight hours or nine hours. And if that's what you do, and that's the mindset you have, and I have friends who are unbelievable artists, musicians, and, and they focus on that thing. And that's who they are, and that's what they do. Um, and that's great. But if, you, if that's not what you do, and you're an integrated person, then you need to understand what does that mean? And how do I integrate all these not just technologies, but the art forms, and, and how do we look at emerging technology? So if you've been doing that for the last 10 years, then you have seen a pretty dramatic transformation with regards to the, you know, the number of people that have access to these tools, software, yeah. hardware. Um, yes. the, the limiting factor has very much become you know, talent and the you know, sort of dedication to, to you know, be able to use the tools right. most effectively. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, how has that changed things for you as a professor? How has it changed things for your students? My, my mantra or my little phrase is uh, comfortable consumer versus competent creator. So a lot of these students come in as comfortable consumers. So you look around the room and you've got the 18-year-old and they can go to Facebook and they can text message and they can do all this stuff. Um, but basically, you know, a monkey could do that. So what we're saying is, well, maybe not. But, but what <laughs> very, we're saying very is, talented what monkey. we're saying basically is, that's that's an automated way, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're really more interested in you exploring these technologies, and how can I use these technologies mm -hmm. to to be an artist and to create things. And that, by the way, goes for science or or art or history or anything really. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a lot of time doing that. That's, that's one of the forces that I spend a lot of time dealing with, which is this magnet of, well, this is all easy. I can just take an image into Photoshop. I've seen it a thousand times. And a student just goes, hits that filter, hits that filter, hits that filter. And it's like, whoa, look what I made. <laughs> and my reaction usually is, no, look what you found. You didn't yeah. really make that. You just push some buttons and this thing popped up. And that's OK. Yeah. So the, the important moment is after I push a few buttons and I start manipulating this work, what do you do now? So where do you go from there? So we're concerned primarily with that, as you said before, the talent and the sort of mental process of, of artistic and and intellectual growth. So it sounds like you uh, wear a lot of hats. Wear a lot of hats. I like wearing a lot of hats. Um, so it keeps I, me young. I've, I, I, I think we have, I think, a good animal to, sh to, to show you uh, with Animal Wonders that, okay. will, that also um, maybe wears a few different hats. At least some different costumes. Jesse has appeared, and with Jesse, we have a very peculiar creature, but one that one that I think people know pretty well. This is a chameleon. It's a chameleon. Is it? Is that it? Is that all it's called? Or no, is it a special it's a kind veiled of, chameleon. It's a veiled chameleon. There's over 100. There's about 160 species of chameleons. Okay. So she is a veiled chameleon, and it's a female, and her name is Twirly. Twirly. <laughs> Twirly. Is that because of her tail? <laughs> Not because of her tail. Because of what happened to her when she was just a little baby. She was dropped. Um, not by us. Um, she was dropped, and so she has some neurological damage, uh, maybe inner ear issues. Mm. Um, but it hasn't hindered her ability to survive, so we haven't right. delved deeper. Yeah. But it, when she crawls down to the ground, she twirls in circles. Oh, hmm. well. Should not do that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she's a, a veiled chameleon, and veiled chameleons have that big crest on the top of their head. Uh huh. Let's see, there we go. <sighs> Free. That's like her comfort blanket. <laughs> <laughs> So, what's the most famous thing about chameleons? They change color. They change color. Do you know why? Uh, well, camouflage uh -huh. is my first guess. It's not camouflage. It's dependent on several different things. Mood, um, social interactions, uh, temperature, light, health, hmm. and also camouflage. Okay. Um, so, so all those what does this together. color mean? Right now, she's a little cold, okay. so she's going to try and get big and dark. So she can absorb, absorb more, more heat. More heat. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So do you have any idea how they change color? No. Super, super cool. You want to find out? Yes. Super cool. Okay. So they have pores. They have they have their outer skin, which is actually transparent. Okay. And then they have three layers of cells underneath. So each layer has a different color you know, ascribed to it. So mm -hmm. we have one color underneath our skin. 
Do you know the name of that? Melanin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, melanin, dark yeah. brown and black. So they have that, that's their first layer too. They have uh, melanophores. And then uh, the layer on top of that is going to be blues and whites. <laughs> and the layer on top of that is going to be reds and yellows. So they have, they're all called uh, chromatophores. And each one of these cells can open and close. So if they open their yellow and their blue pores at the same time, they're going to be green. So then the light reflects off of it and creates the green color. And if they, you know, open all their pores and get all the way down to the melanin, they're going to be dark browns and blacks and it's going to look very dark like this. Mm -hmm. um, so they can change by opening up and go, it can happen very fast. Right, can, can they move that. their eyes independently? Yeah. yeah. Completely independent. So, so one, one can, can stay and one can move. I mean, yeah, this right. one animal can do that. Yes. Can say, I'm going to look and do stereoscopic right now, Yes. or I'm just gonna go all crazy and keep my eye out for everything. Yeah, so they move completely independently of each other. So they have 360 degrees, up, mm -hmm. down, around, behind, it's everywhere, and uh, they don't have to have the binocular vision to get their prey, they can use just one eye. What a beautiful animal. Is she full size? Or? She's not full size. These guys live about four years, so she can get quite a bit bigger. Oh, and they different <laughs> four years. years? About four, not That's very not much long. of a run, is it? No. <laughs> no, for no. a lizard? Not very yeah, long. Yeah, they usually live mm -mm. quite a long time. No, yeah, twenty, sometimes thirty yeah. years. No, these guys are very short lived. Yeah. Man, there are so many amazing animals just in your house and also in the whole world. In the whole world. Oh, no. Twirly, thank you for coming to visit us here on the SciShow Talk Show. Jesse, thanks for bringing him in, sure. and Rick. Thank you for being here and also training my whole staff. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> what would I have done without you? And thank you for watching this episode of the SciShow Talk Show. If you want to keep getting smarter with us here at SciShow, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. Bye.